Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. Okay, thanks. It's been my privilege the last few weeks to uh, share with you out of this context in 1 Peter uh, what I think are some very important um, Bible interpretation principles that might help us better understand what God's will for our life is. I am committed, absolutely, completely committed to the Bible is the only clear self-revelation of the one true God. I believe you can affirm that with me. I am absolutely committed that we must walk in light of what we understand the Bible to say individually, which means we don't always agree on how to interpret it, but that we will stand before God for what we believe the Bible has said and how we have lived that understanding. So I do not think it's inappropriate for Christians to disagree. As a matter of fact, I've come in my life to believe that the different ways that Christians approach Scripture uh, has to reflect the personality types of those Christians. And the difference among Christians is God's way to reach the difference among the lost world. So I think that our plurality is our strength, not our weakness. Now there are some truths that that does not apply to. Deity of Christ, justification by faith, <laughs> Uh, inspiration of scripture, these are not issues that are negotiable. No, no, they are affirmations to live or die for. But so much that splits Baptist and splits evangelical Christianity is not on that same level. It's on a cultural level. And what we have done, and I've tried, <laughs> I've tried smiling at you and screaming at you to drag you through this miserable understanding, and it is not a fun thing to talk about, but an absolutely necessary thing to talk about. And that is that as we approach the Bible, we must remember two things. Number one, that I have been influenced, you have been influenced, we have been influenced by 20th, particularly 20th century and 21st century, American democratic capitalism. Now, if you think you're uninfluenced, there's a pretty good example right there. And you come to Scripture with a cultural conditioning. And anything in Scripture that seems to violate or speak with other voices than what you're used to, either ignore or twist. And what we want the Bible to do is affirm us in our current cultural Christianity. And, of course, what the Bible wants to do is radically speak to us amidst our comfortable cultural Christianity. Now, the question comes then, and I think it's a fair question to ask me. Uh, I have been working through First Peter as a model of how you must interpret the Bible in context. You just can't jump into a verse here, a verse there, a book here, a book there, and come out with a commitment to the original author is the only inspired person. And that all proper interpretation must begin with those who first heard or read the original author. Now, brothers and sisters, these are uncompromisable principles for me. Now, for the last few weeks, I have been dealing with a context that could be characterized as submission. Now, first of all, submission is exactly opposite of what American Christianity and Western culture is all about. We're into the dignity and worth of individuals, and I, I certainly affirm that. But something radical has happened to us. We are to be submissive to earthly government even when we do not agree with that earthly government. We are to be submissive slaves to masters even when the masters are cruel. And today, we are to be submissive wives to husbands and husbands to act gently toward their wives. Now, this submission goes against the grain. And I have tried to say to you that if, as Jesus was submissive to his earthly parents and his heavenly father, that submission cannot be a negative or weak biblical mandate. 
But it is a mandate that goes against the basic tenet of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree that has polluted our minds and hearts into whatever I want, whatever I need, whatever I can do, I have the right to do it. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the writings of Nietzsche and some of those other uh, philosophers, but this is exactly the philosophy behind um, a Nazism in Germany. It, it's a belief that we are alive, we're here on the planet for a few years, we're here by evolutionary means only. If you're strong enough, do it. The weak are just there to be done to. Now, I think that the fall has caused all of us to turn inward to what's in it for me, what do I get out of it, what can I do to others, what, how do I control my own life. What submission does, submission is one way to keep score that the fall is still not predominant in your life. Submission is one way to keep score that the fall is still not predominant in your life. If I can yield my rights and authority, if I can yield my desires to others, even outside Christendom, it says something about my willingness. And I want to say to you that the reason for the submission in all three of these contexts is evangelism. We submit not because we're weak people and we don't have our own opinion and authority. We submit so that the kingdom of God might be lifted up in a similar way to the way Jesus submitted to earthly parents, the heavenly father, and Rome as he died on a cross. Now, unfortunately, that goes against everything, everything that our society is teaching us from elementary school in all of our movies, in all of our cultural forms. Everything goes against that. And yet the Bible comes back to this again and again. That we are not here for ourselves. That how we live does make a difference. And that God wants to manifest the kingdom of God now through those who let him be king in their lives even before he returns. Now, for me, I'm, I'm going to do a, a bit of an excursion here before I get in the text. I certainly am smart enough to understand that everybody here will not agree with me. I pray that you would prayerfully listen to what I say, think through it, and then can act on what you believe is your understanding of God's will from your life based on Scripture and not what you're used to. I have said to you, I said it last week, that the tenets of Christianity overcame slavery, but that Scripture itself does not oppose slavery. And I even alluded to, I kind of uh, shot my pistol off before I, this week, about the home. That the issue of Christian women in society is also affected by this. That there are some, some very strong texts about uh, women be submissive, and many Christians do not know how to handle those texts because they are not the only text in the Bible. So the question comes, and it is a question that I wish I could be more forceful with. I cannot, but I want to struggle with you with this question a bit, and then I'll, I'll give you my perspective. If it is true that the Bible contains some cultural elements, I think you would have to agree with me on that if you read 1 Corinthians at all. How do I, as a sincere Bible-believing Christian in the 21st century, happen to have grown up in America, how do I ascertain what is eternal for every person in every culture in every age and what is the cultural particularity of first century Greco-Roman Empire that should pass away? I hope you hear the poignancy of this question. How do I determine as a Christian what has eternal relevance from Scripture and what is a part of the culture but not a part of God's plan for every church in every age in every part of the world? I guess um, 
You, sometimes you can tell a lot about a, a person who preaches by who their favorite authors are. <laughs> I think the people who have influenced me the most through the years have been F.F. F. Bruce and Garden Fee. And they've influenced me because they've been willing to take on the tough questions and not just espoused a denominational perspective. They have given me the freedom to think through issues without just affirming what I've always been told. That freedom has made me a dangerous person. Because I believe the Bible's a word of God and I refuse to bow to anyone or anything but the living word and the written word, period. That makes me a dangerous person in our day. Now, as I come to this, uh, the book that has helped me the most struggle through this is a book on Bible interpretation. I wish I could get every one of you to read it. It costs $15. It's a book called How to Read the Bible for All It is Worth. How to Read the Bible. Surely you would write this down if I told you, and you tell me week after week you enjoy my sermons, you enjoy my perspective, and I tell you here's the book that has helped me more than any other book, and you wouldn't write the title down? How to Read the Bible for All It Is Worth by Doug Stewart and Garden Fee. This particular chapter was written by Garden Fee. He does the New Testament part, Doug Stewart does the Old Testament part. And he mentioned that one of the ways that he has come to deal with this is when he reads scripture and some of these items that every culture struggles with, it seems that the Bible again and again says the same thing. Old Testament or New, Peter or John, Isaiah or Jude, when this issue comes up, the Bible speaks with one voice. He would say that those are universal principles to be applied in every culture and every day. But if the Bible, Old Testament and New, begins to speak with two voices, now the Bible certainly speaks with two voices in the area of women. There are some texts that are very, very strong. 1 Corinthians 14 1 Timothy 2. These are the two critical texts on the place of women in the life of the church. But as I've said to you, a proof text method of Paul leads to terrible theology. For in many other places, Paul seems to say something else about women. Now me, I, I thought to myself, how do I illustrate this most poignantly? So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be transparent and vulnerable something interim pastors can do that pastors are more dangerous to do. How do I deal with scriptures that speak with two voices versus scriptures that seem to speak with one voice? People would say to me, okay, Utley, you have said that uh, there are some things like slavery, and women's issues that are cultural and that the basic tenets of Christianity have showed us that all of those texts are not literally relevant for every culture in every place. I could add to that this idea about Jesus drank wine. And some special interest groups would say to me, okay, we, we agree with you on that then why would you oppose homosexuality as a viable lifestyle when the text in the New Testament may be historically conditioned? I stepped in and now, didn't I? Watch the principle. The text on homosexuality, whether Leviticus or Paul, speak with one voice. Homosexuality is not the will of God. There is never a text where it is positive or condoned. It is out of the will of God. And before I leave that, before I leave that, as a Bible teacher, I am just as appalled at premarital sex 
and extramarital sex as I am on homosexual sex. Equally, 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 biblically articulate against. It is out of the will of God for premarital sex for any reason. Sorry, culture. Sorry, my own children. God's will is one man, one woman for life. That is the ideal across cultures and across time. Now, if we add in sexual promiscuity and illicit sexual affairs as everybody is doing it, or it's just the way our culture is, that is as sick and as unbiblical and as damnable as homosexuality or bestiality. We love to pick issues to make ourselves look self-righteous. We find one sin we don't do, and then we magnify it to make ourselves look spiritual. God loves homosexuals. And I wish there were more in our churches. I'm even so radical as to believe. Now this is where I hope you have your socks up all the way. I'm so radical as to believe that homosexuals who feel called to ministry and choose to be celibate for the kingdom of God ought to be allowed to be leaders in the church of Jesus Christ. You say, boy, that's a radical statement. I am, I am a college professor, and I know there are men and women committed to ministry who would make love to every person in our school if they could. But because they're called, and because they're committed to Scripture, they choose to limit that sexual activity for the kingdom of God. I thank God for them. It's not that people don't struggle with sexuality. We are sexual creatures from birth to grave. It's how we handle the sexuality that makes us people of the kingdom. So, so hard to reach a balance here because the minute I say something, one side wants to affirm half of what I say and the other side wants to condemn half. It is so hard to talk to people who are so biased. And we're all biased. I was thinking last week, Spirit spoke to me. I just didn't get it out of my mouth in time. I, I was talking about um, how, how much against I am uh, the human trafficking, that how much I believe in the dignity and worth of the human person made in the image and likeness of God. And boy, the Spirit spoke to my heart. It just, it somehow it got lost, but I want to say it now. I, I, I was sitting there and said, you're going to say it, aren't you? I said, yeah, I'm going to say it. I hope you know I wear these little feet on my, my, my chest here. These, these are uh, the fully formed feet of a, of an infant before they're born. I am, I am against abortion. I am against abortion. But what bothers me is a church that'll be against abortion, but not against poverty. It's like, we're for you till you're born, then you're on your own, fool. It's like, we don't care if you're ignorant, uneducated. We don't care if they turn children into soldiers. We're just against abortion, and we're spiritual. No, no, God is the creator and sustainer of life, and life belongs to Him, whether in the womb or in the nursing home. And God's people ought to be for life, for life. And what we are is for political parties. We're into ethics that you can put on a sign and hold up to make yourself look spiritual, but a life that's lived in spending all of your resources on yourself and coming to church two hours a week. We need to realize that submission to the will of God is a daily characteristic of the children of God who struggle with a daily internal conflict between the old nature and the new nature. It is the new nature that cares for life. It is the old nature that cares for self. It is the new nature that is willing to yield itself to whatever culture so that Jesus might be lifted up so that that culture might come to him. 
It is the old cult, the old nature that says, it's my life, I'll live it the way I want to. Now, in some, in some wonderful ways, redemption is a reversal of the fall. If the fall was the orientation of life toward me, redemption is freedom from me. In some ways, my salvation is from, not just to. I'm free not to, to not take advantage, to not abuse those who don't have the power or education that I have. I choose not to in Jesus Christ. Now, if that, if that just bothers you, I hope you'll think about reading How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, and I hope you'll pray for me, because I'm going to stand before God one day too. But so are you. And I bet how we've tra treated people is going to mean a lot more than what denomination you belong to or what emblem is on your lapel. Because I know my Bible well enough to know that in Matthew 25, Jesus didn't say, all you who prayed to receive me, get on this side. No, he said, I was hungry, and you fed me, and I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was in prison, and you visited me, and I was sick, and you came unto me. God's people are characterized not by a prayer somewhere in the past, but by their daily, godly commitment to love people in his stead and to help them find him, period. Now, that's the introduction. Would you turn to chapter 3 of 1 Peter? I want to go through this quickly. i got 15 minutes or so. In the same way, links chapter 3, verse 1, to the two submissions earlier, submission to government, a submission of slaves to their masters. And notice again that wives are to submit. My, my wife, ha <laughs> she's here, she's at the hotel. She, her back's hurt and she can't sit up. And I did not want her to fall over in the pew during my sermon. It gives the wrong impression. Um, <laughs> she said, you said last week that wives don't have to be subject. And this week it says it, ha <laughs> ha, Peggy, turkey, you. Um, last week, I, what I went, meant to say, you know, it, it just takes two to tango and it takes two to do life well. Um, what I meant to say last week is there's not a command, right? Um, we, we, this is a middle voice verb just like Ephesians 5.22. If it comes from 5.21, which is mutual submission, then 5.22 is a, is a middle voice, which means that the subject of the sentences does the action for self-interest. Now, this is not so much a command. It's, wives, this is how to do kingdom life. And the purpose of doing kingdom life in this particular context, it is accentuated so well, is the redemption of the lost partner. Now I want to say to you, this text cannot be used for. I saw this beautiful woman and I'm in love with her and she's not a Christian, but the Spirit told me it was okay. Hormones are rushing around. Scripture is not. In the early, early first century, many, many people came to Christ. That meant that many families had one believer and one non-believer. This cannot be a proof text for a believer can marry a non-believer. This is not that subject. This is, you're married, you've come to Christ, your partner has not come to Christ, what do you do about it? Well, you begin to live in such a way that they begin to see that the consequences of a selfishness from the fall has somehow been changed in the way you treat them, the unbeliever. They begin to look at the way you live and the, what you say and how you do it, and they become wonderfully attracted to what has changed in you. And the door becomes open for a witness for Jesus Christ. The purpose of submission is not weakness, but kingdom living. Eternal life has observable characteristics. Limiting of my freedom for the cause of Christ, both culturally and my biblical freedom. In order that, and here's the purpose clause, the henna clause, if first class conditional, any of them are, were disobedient, one partner does not obey truth, To the word, this is the word logos, 
Now, the word here would be apostolic preaching because they did not have a printed New Testament. So if they're obedient to what they heard, Peter, James, John, Paul, preach. If they're obedient to that, here they're unobedient to that. I was uh, thinking about this when I was looking at this little word. You know, back in chapter 1, verse 23, it says we're born again by the word, apostolic preaching. And in chapter 2, verse 2, it says we are to desire the sincere, pure milk of the word. So we're talking about apostolic truth here. One of, the, one of the partners refuses to believe the gospel. What do you do? Well, then we have the word one. Now this means, obviously, bring to salvation. I don't know anything more. Through the years, I'm not a counselor. Oh, yuck, I'm just not a counselor. But if you're the pastor, you... <laughs> How many wives have I heard in my life cry and pray for the salvation of their husbands? And how many wonderful times has it happened? You mean a, here's a Christian lady and she decides in Jesus Christ that she's going to do everything she can that by the way she lives to bring honor to Jesus and help someone that she loves but that does not know or honor Jesus to become aware of his presence by the difference in her life? That's what I'm saying. How many of us need to have that kind of commitment to a lost child? Not just a lost spouse. How about a lost family member or a lost neighbor? Are we willing to pay the price to live such a non-cultural, non-selfish, godly, submissive lifestyle that others will want to know what is different about you? And the problem is, for all of us in America, nothing is different about us except the cross we wear on our lapel or the bumper sticker we have on our car. Be one without a word. Godly submission, selfless living, speaks louder than any tract. How we love to give tracts to people. I used to give tracts to waitresses in restaurants until one of them one day said, come here. And she pulled out a drawer full of tracts that people had given her said, you know, the ones who give these tracts never give a tip. <laughs> so all the waiters just put all the tracts in a drawer. <laughs> oh, we feel better because we gave a tract. This girl still doesn't know Christ. I still remember <laughs> this young woman who came to me at school and told me she thought God had called her to preach. What should she do? I remember telling her, if God called you, I'm chopped liver. This same wonderful woman came to eat lunch with another professor and I at a BGCT meeting in Waco one day, and we asked her to pray for us. <laughs> Golly, it was so wonderful. This wonderful woman said to the waiter, we're about to pray for our food. Is there anything we could pray for you about? And that waiter said, my brother in North Carolina has cancer. Would you pray for him? And my friend said, what's his name? <laughs> it's so much better than a stinking track. <laughs> it's one-on-one -on -one love flowing out of a believer naturally. Without a word, there'll be one when they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Wow. Wow. I've said it to you, I don't know how to say it again. Eternal life has observable characteristics. In verse 3, uh, this, this is going to be a little touchy for me because I like to wear wild clothes. I mean, you know that because I'm a Hawaiian church freak. I mean, I used, to have a, I used to have a suit that was red. I mean, red. I bought it at a University of Houston uh, on sale. It took nine volt batteries. I mean, it... Uh. <laughs> It was really obnoxious. I mean, when those leisure suits were in, I had bright chicken yellow ones and baby blue. I, I figure God made cones and rods in your eyes, and I want to get full use of the creation of God. <laughs> anyway, it became across pretty obnoxious to some people. So I, I realize that I'm kind of stepping on my own eggshells here, but I think what we want to say to people is, I, you know, I go to Brazil a lot. <laughs> I recognize Brazil from the, the deal this morning. I tell you, the Christian women in Brazil, 
They affirm cleavage. The most godly women I know in Brazil wear shirts that back here you wouldn't wear. I mean, in church. It's just the norm. I guess it's not a thong, so it's all right. But woo. Now, in Brazil, you can wear one of those. But if you're from Brazil and you come here, get a shawl. I mean, there are cultural differences on how you dress. Amen? Now, am I supposed to dress in such a way that I wear a robe with holes in it? I remember a brother I used to know, he, he was losing weight, I forgot why, but he kept wearing the same pants. They just kept be gathered up. It, di it didn't look spiritual, it looked tacky. He might have looked tacky to be Christian. Croak, no. Don't be tacky. But the other side is, I don't need to dress to draw attention to myself. Ladies or men, I don't need to dress so as to draw undue attention to myself in the church what ought to cause the appropriate attention is a godly chase lifestyle love flowing through a person irregardless of what they wear but in Roman society this is first century Rome most of this verse 3 most of it has to do with the elaborate hairstyles of Roman society I mean the uh, it was worse than those beehive things of the 50s. I mean, they were, they were tall. It took days to get them. They couldn't sleep normal. They had gold jewelry in it. And everybody wanted to look just like that. The problem is they had a very expensive hairdo and a lifestyle with absolutely no Christian attractiveness. Now, I... <laughs> My, our Mary Kay friend said to my wife one time, after 50, wear really red lipstick. <laughs> I'm for red lipstick, friends. Powder that thing up. Let's get, put a few ear bobs on it. Do what you can. All of Ole, all of Ole. Yes, do it. <laughs> but if you spend all your money on creams and ointments to make yourself look better, I think you misunderstood this text. This certainly isn't saying don't wear jewelry, don't get your hair fixed. You want a happy woman? Let her get her hair fixed. <laughs> and if you want a happy woman, when she says to you, how do you like this? This is the one time you better know it's the will of God to lie. <laughs> I don't care what you say, you dead meat, right? Just tell her, oh, honey, that'll do it. That's all you can do. I guess what I'm... <laughs> Thank you for letting me be free. I'm... And you know Peggy's not here, right? <laughs> she can't catch me either right now, so can't run. Oh, well. Look at verse 4. The hidden person of the heart. The hidden... Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? The hidden person of the heart. The hidden person of the heart is what's to be beautiful. How is your hidden person of the heart? I know this is a church in America. We are the wealthiest people in the world. So I'm not wealthy. Compared to the world, we're the top 5 or 10%. You, you, you can wear what you want to wear. Do you choose? Now listen to Mrs. O'Hara. Peggy told me a few days. She said, why don't you buy some more suits? I said, Peggy, I'm going to wear this suit every Sunday to try to help rich people know that how many suits you have is not a spiritual issue. How many new shoes do you need, ladies? Beautiful shoes is what makes you an attractive woman. How many diamond stick pins? How much jewelry? I want to tell you a Christ-like spirit causes a glow that this world cannot match with any of its finery. And what we need is glowing Christians with the beauty and wealth of the new covenant, new heart, and new spirit, alive in every daily situation, loving people, yielding their freedoms for the cause of Christ. And if they will, the church will be full, the kingdom will grow, and we will be happy. But as we seek for more and more at any cost, we violate the text we know well, and people have no desire to become one of us. 
Women, how you live can change the person you live with. That goes both ways, of course. Just a few more points. Notice here where it says uh, in verse 6, if you do what is right, there is no if there in the Greek text. It's an assumed if, but it's not a textual if. And notice that next phrase, without being frightened by any fear. I guess what has been such a peace for me, I guess it happened several years ago when this, this adult in one of my classes said, I had a vision of you. I said, oh, really? Great. I said, I saw you in the fire. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. I thought, what do I do now? Go home and get a fire extinguisher and sit in my bathtub for the rest of my life? No, I got a, Peggy's out of town. I got a Bible study. It's 30 miles north. I'm going to the Bible study. If I go home, I get to go home. If I die going to Karnak some Sunday night, please don't you cry for me, would you? Please have one of those New Orleans parties for me. I gone home. Fear, gone. Why? Because I know him who cast out all fear. I'm staying for you. I'm not staying for me. I'm trying to live for him. I got tickled this morning. I was shaking hands over there and thought to myself, Utley, what are you running for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but it's just real important that I show you that God loves you if I possibly can. You are a significant person, and I'll try to model that for you by caring for you, whether we agree, disagree, or not. Something's happened to me, and I can't get over it. And it's affected every decision of my life. I can't be the same anymore. You husbands, this weaker vessel deal, I bet... I got $100, well, if I did, that's a lie, I got 25 But if I did, I bet I could beat 90% of the women in arm wrestling today. Anybody? Now, 10% of you, I wouldn't fight you no matter what, but 90%, I'd arm wrestle you. Weaker vessel has to do with the fact that women don't have the upper body strength of men. Has nothing to do with any kind of inferiority. As a, as a Baptist preacher, I want to affirm the full equality and giftedness of women. You say, where'd you get that from? Your personal opinion? No, I did not get it from my personal opinion because everything in my culture is going the other direction, particularly my Baptist culture. I know Genesis. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Made he them, male and female, in his image and likeness. I know that when God created Adam first, he created a helpmate, which is a Hebrew word for an equal commensurate power, not a subservient power. I know that God created Adam first, but in full fellowship with God, Without sin in the world, Adam was lonely. An incomplete creation. It may be that the male dominance of the fall, if you don't know it, read Genesis 3. Look at ancient cultures and some modern. It could be that salvation reverses the influence of Genesis 3 and that in Christ, the equality of Genesis 1 and 2 is restored in time. That's just a theological position of mine. I hope you'll think about it. I'm for the full rights of every living person, <laughs> young and old, rich or poor, educated, uneducated, uterus, non-uterus, Human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. All of them are precious to God. He wants to change you to win more of them. And what's the problem? The problem is me. The problem is I'm used to. The problem is I've always heard. The problem is I want to do it my way. The problem is what's in it for me? You get to die. Jesus gets to live through you. You get to be submissive to your government. I don't like the government. 
People des- get what they deserve. I'm a slave. I was born a slave. Be a really good slave for Christ. I'm married to a jerk. Live for Christ. I don't care what you are, where you're born, who you are, how educated you are, how wealthy you are. Live for Christ. Bloom where you're planted. There is no greener grass. And today's the day. And the person next to you is the opportunity. Don't be telling me, oh, I like that sermon, and let me hear you say an ugly word to somebody going out to church. Family, non-family. See, God keeps score, not for salvation, but he wants us to live for him. Peter is messing in daily, personal, intimate family stuff. And Peter is doing it because Peter would say, if you met Jesus Christ, you can't be the same. And whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever circumstance you're in, God can use you in a marvelous way because you are special to God. May we pray. Well, Lord, this is quite a uh, theological plate to set before people. But I respect your Holy Spirit in them. I respect that... uh, Uh, They have uh, read the word, been in the word, heard the word. I I trust that they will pray and think through these issues and be willing to change based on their understanding of your will for their lives. Not my understanding, your understanding through the book to them. I pray that you would give us a heart that's different from our world and culture. That you would give us a heart that those who don't know you would know that something's different about us that something has happened in our life and we can't be the way we once were. That it's so different and so radical that people who have no social importance suddenly become priority. And that what we resist is pride and power, not seek it. And that your children are a children that love one another even as you have loved them. And as they love one another, And even love a lost world, love overcomes every other fallen human emotion. And I thank you for godly wives who have loved their husbands into the kingdom. And those who do not have all the wealth and power, who whatever job they may have, have done that job with honesty, dignity, and love, and their co-workers have come to know you. I pray for those who work in levels of government, whatever level that may be, that not power, uh, not parties, not political agendas, but love, integrity, honesty, commitment, will supersede all the natural tendencies that power brings. Lord, if you don't protect us, we're vulnerable We're vulnerable to a fallen nature. We're vulnerable to a fallen culture. And we're vulnerable to a fallen angelic power. But you have surrounded us and indwelt us with your spirit, your book, and your people. And we pray that as we love one another, study, and pray on behalf of each other, that a supernatural fellowship will develop that the world will not know how to answer and would like to be a part of. And I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, you'd start that at Lakeside Baptist Church. Yea, even today. Amen.